morning and thank you for joining us for this week's service, whether you call Epicenter your church or it's your first time joining us. Currently we're going through a series on the book of Revelation and today we'll be focusing on chapter 14 that will cover topics we have already looked into but we'll quickly recap before getting to a harvesting event described at the end of the chapter with bloodshed described to pour over 180 miles long and reaching as high as a horse's bridle. Whether you're new to the church or even if you just want to catch up on the past sermon se series, you can scan the QR code displayed on the screen on your mobile device that will direct you to our YouTube channel playlist for this series. If you don't have a mobile device, you can simply go to YouTube, find our channel, which is Wadena Epicenter, click on the playlist to access the previous sermons from this series. As we go through this message, we just want to encourage you to follow along with your Bibles and jot down some notes on your worship programs. If you have kids that are between the ages of 4 and 6th grade, we have Epicenter Kids that's currently in progress. Or if you have little ones that are 0 to 3, year, three years old and you'd like to bring them to the parent room, you can do so as well. You can listen in and watch the service right there. We also have tablets for the little ones if they'd like to stay in the service. They're located on the info table. So a number of years back, I came across this YouTube channel, and I was intrigued, but as you can see, I was also terrified. You know, seeing some of the content, it's interesting. And after watching a few cartoon characters that were transformed into these human portraits, you realize that if these cartoon characters actually existed in real life, 
Parents wouldn't be lining up their kids to take a picture at Nickelodeon Universe with these creepy people, right? Sometimes it's best to see things through the lens that they were designed to be seen rather than taking creative, a creative license approach. And as we have been going through this series on the book of Revelation, we've talked about different views that people have regarding the book of Revelation. And when we get into certain things, some people take the creative license of trying to give it an interpretation that's not there. In other words, it, it sounds really creepy, and nonetheless, it's going to be really unique as we talk about it. And there is definitely some intensity and some literal ways to look at it, but it looks almost like that Mario. It looks creepy in real life because it's meant to be symbolic. In other words, you, you can't necessarily translate something in a way that it's not intended to be. And we've talked about the literal views that people have regarding the book of Revelation as there are events that are described, there's physical characteristics that are not only hard to picture, like we talked about the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth. We talked about the, the visual representation of the Son of Man. This was almost a year ago. We've actually been on this series for 20 weeks. It's, it's that in depth. But as we've seen this, we realize that Jesus doesn't have flames of fire for eyes. It was a symbolic representation of judgment that was coming. If that was so, he's represented one way, then he's talked about as a lion of the tribe of Judah, then he's seen as a bloody lamb. So which one is it? What's the characteristic of God? What does, or what Jesus, what does he look like? It's meant to be symbolic, right? The book of Revelation is conveying something greater, and when we try to give it a literal interpretation, you end up with something like that Mario in human life. It doesn't quite fit the narrative of what it's saying. Now, as we've envisioned these things that are described, we begin to be horrified of what these events are going to look like in real life when they do come to pass. Now, let me once again add that while these events are definitely going to be difficult, they're going to be unrivaled by any other moment in history, as Jesus stated, right? There will be no other time in history or in the present that will be unlike this moment, or that will be like this moment. So we understand that it is going to be a difficult time. But the question of this is how literal are the descriptions that are being given? And how much of it is symbolic? And that's definitely the tricky part when you get into the book of Revelation. And as we get into Revelation chapter 14, it's no different than every other chapter that we've tackled. But at the end of the chapter, there is this gruesome battle that is described to be total carnage with bloodshed of unimaginable amounts. So before we get into that event that is described at the end of the chapter, we get other descriptions of events, and there's other details that we've actually covered in other sermons. But nonetheless, we're going to go through them just to kind of catch up on things that maybe you weren't here for, or even just to, once again, lay out the foundation for what we're talking about. Typically what I do is I lay out all the verses up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, I do encourage you to take those out. It's extremely important to kind of know what we're tackling. With this chapter, I'm not going to have the verses up there, but if you have your Bibles, once again, make sure and take them out. We do have Bibles available out in the info table. If you don't have one, it's our gift to you, and if you like to use one, you're more than welcome to. But once again, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of everything that is described in chapter 14. There will be some verses that we'll focus on, but for the most part, it's content that we've already covered in previous um, messages. So verse 1 describes the lamb. That, that's the way that it's described. Now, if you were to take a literal view of this, you're not going to see an animal as a matter of fact, it's symbolic. It's a symbolic representation of Jesus, the Lamb of God, right? Who was, who was uh, sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus becomes that perfect sacrifice for us. So once again, when the Lamb is referenced here, don't picture an animal. It's talking about Jesus. So it's said that Jesus is standing outside of Mount Zion, or standing on Mount Zion, which is actually a geographical location on earth. And this Mount Zion is actually located right outside the city of Jerusalem. So that's where it would be at. Mount Zion 
through Scripture, throughout the Bible, is always a spiritual landmark for Israel. In other words, this is a geographical location representative of God's presence here on earth. Now, the verse also says that there were 144,000 who had God's name written on their forehead. We talked about this last week in regards to the mark of the beast. But as mentioned during a message that I preached back in the month of May titled Maximum Capacity, and we won't go in depth into this because we already tackled it, but I believe that the 144,000 that are mentioned in the book of Revelation is not a literal number, nor is it describing a literal 120 or 120 or 44,000 from a literal tribe of Israel. And just kind of really recapturing that, the reason why is if you look at the names of the tribes, that's never the tribes that are used in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, Joseph is never a tribe. And it actually mentions the, the tribe of Joseph. Levi, Levi doesn't have any territory, and ultimately the tribe of Levi is mentioned there. There's different tribes that are missing. There's a lot more in there. You can go and check out the, the sermon titled Maximum Capacity. And once again, you'll see that it's really problematic when you take a literal view of these 144,000. The best interpretation that I believe to be true is to understand its spiritual representation. John has said that there was 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. He turns and he doesn't see 144,000. He actually sees a number too great to count. The best way to see this is that the 144,000 now mentioned in Revelation chapter 14 are believers from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, New Covenant, New Testament, and it's too great to count. There was 12 tribes, there was 12 apostles, and then one of the numbers that is typically used in the Bible to reference to a number too great to count is 1,000, like God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That would be 12 times 12, 144 times 1,000, 144,000. Now, once again, not that there is not a great significance to the people of Israel historically. And even right now, if you've watched the news, there is a war that has been declared by Israel on Hamas with everything that's going on. So definitely significant. But nonetheless, the 144,000 mentioned here are not a literal number of Jews. So when you look at the passage, one of the things that the, these 144,000 are doing, once again, you see the Lamb, Jesus, standing, out, uh, standing on Mount Zion, which would be outside the city of Jerusalem. There are 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. That's what it says. And they're singing a new song that no one else could learn. How cool would that be, right? Nobody else knows this song. And, and actually, when you look at the passage, you see that there is no audience, these 144,000 are actually singing in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders that we talked about early on in this series. Verse 4 states that these 144,000 have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. Now, this is extremely important. It's going to give us a clear indication of the 144,000. It also says, they have told no lies. They are without blame. Extremely significant. Okay, so the description of these 144,000 being as pure as virgins may lead us to think of this being a physical choice or a physical devotion that they have taken, right? We typically see, I mean, of course, when we talk about being a virgin, it's sexual purity. The only thing is that this verse is not talking about sexual purity because it's extremely clear that it's metaphorical. It says, they have kept themselves as pure as virgins. It's giving us a purity, but it's not physical in origin, so the verse continues by, and this is how we see that answer itself. The verse continues by saying that they follow Jesus, the Lamb, wherever he goes. This is extremely important. They have left the path that they were on. They have separated themselves from the world. And they are following Jesus. Any person that ultimately follows Jesus is a believer of God, right? It's ultimately 
a Christian. These are people who have also been said to be purchased from the people of the earth as a special offering to God and to Jesus the Lamb. Now, once again, there's a lot of issues if you start to take a literal approach of these 144,000 people. For one, they are purchased from among the earth. And I don't believe that this purchase is limited to 144,000 in a specific time period. Some people assume that these 144,000 people will be Jews during the Great Tribulation, the moment that things get really difficult, and it's going to be a future moment, but that's not what it's conveying. It seems to be encompassing all believers since the foundation of the earth who have decided to follow Jesus, and the passage also says something unique. These 144,000 have told no lies and are without blame. And this is really hard to reconcile. You know, some people might say, well, that, that's what it is, right? If you take a literal approach to this. But there is a really difficult part about reconciling that with the entire Bible. Not only does Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 state that not a single person on the earth is always good and never sins, but it also states it again in 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, that if we claim to have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. As a matter of fact, if you go to the heart of the gospel, right? What, what does the gospel state? And, the, and that is that we are not without blame, that we are not without blemish. It actually tells us that if we were to stand in our current condition without the sacrifice of Jesus, we stand condemned and guilty before God because, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which is, which is the essence of the gospel in a sense, it is this, everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. No one can stand before God and, said, I am blame, and say, I am blameless. I have never sinned. I have never told a lie. As a matter of fact, that's a reason that the gospel is offensive. Because the Bible over and over and over again indicates that no one is pure of heart, that there is no one that is good, and there is nobody that does good all the time, and nobody can stand justified before God on their own morality or works. It's simply impossible. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that our good works are like filthy rags before God. Even the, the best thing that you can do is still dirty because there's always a hidden motive behind it. I was talking to someone the other day and we we're talking about this very thing. When you think about good works, you know, we think about, well, I've done this for another person, I've done this. And, and if you really think about our motive, which nobody can evaluate, only you can ultimately determine that, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, the reason behind and the motive behind it is that we want to feel like good people. And, and if you really think about that, it's more so our interpretation of what is good. Typically, we want for people to think that we're good. There, there's a motive there. It's not simply because we, it naturally comes. There's a motive of wanting to feel good. So once again, this is not a representation of perfect people because outside of Jesus, nobody is good all the time. Nobody has never sinned outside of the, the life of Jesus. If that was the case, Jesus would not have, have come to die here on earth because we could have done it on our own. The 144,000 could have been that, those people. But this is describing this message that ultimately these are believers from the foundation of the earth to the moment of this judgment day to the great tribulation that ultimately people are marked on their foreheads spiritually because they have followed Jesus and they ultimately stand justified on the blood of Jesus. So once again, not a literal 144,000, but a crowd that is too great to count of believers since the creation of humanity. And these believers, if you really think about what, what saves us, so Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of, the, uh, of God's glorious standard. Ultimately, this is what happens when we understand that, right? This is, a, this is the gospel. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, it just simply follows. It says, God, in his grace, 
has made us right in his sight, right? So, so we didn't do anything. God did it. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. So that's the essence of the gospel. Broken people who follow Jesus, ultimately, they, are, they stand blameless because of Jesus. We stand justified by what Jesus did, not by what we accomplished, because it's simply impossible. We stand before God because of the gospel that saves us and marks us and seals us for that day that we ultimately come before the presence of God. And and this is a gospel that actually verses 6 and 7 of chapter 14 are stated. And this is what John says when he says that he saw another angel flying through the sky carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And I just want to emphasize, to proclaim to the people who belong, that's important, to this world. We'll come back to that. Verse 7, and this is what the angel said. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge... Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. So this angel is proclaiming the gospel. And what's interesting is, it says those who belong to this world. Do you realize that the gospel is not being proclaimed to Christians? Even in the, the, in the moment that judgment is coming, God is still sending an angel, a messenger, to proclaim, to announce the good news And it's not just to a nation, right? As some speculate that the 144,000 will be people that are Jews that ultimately will hear the message, will repent of their sins and turn to God. This is actually telling us that this good news is not for a small group, but to everyone, not that is saved, but who belongs to this world, that are spiritually dead. And it's every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. It is every single individual will hear the gospel. People who have rejected Jesus are still hearing the message that they have rejected. And as we see throughout the book of Revelation, we're going to see that these people are hearing the message and they're seeing God's acts, but they still refuse to repent. No one will enter hell without knowing the truth that they rejected. It's just not the case. Now, here's the thing. There may be no shortage of excuses, but there will be no shortage of opportunities either. Nobody will enter hell because they did not know. I love how A.W. Tozer puts it, Christ will be Lord or he will be judge. Every man must decide whether we will take him as Lord now or face him as judge then. Right? We, we get to choose. As stated in the passage, there will be no shortage of opportunities and the very reason, or and the reason why there will be no shortage of opportunities is because regardless of how some churches portray and convey this angry God who just wants to, he's waiting at the opportunity, just like, you know, licking his chops, just like ready to strike you at, at your first screw up. That's actually not at all what the Bible conveys. Now, here's the thing. For sure, there is going to be a day of judgment There's going to be a day of wrath. There's going to be a a day of difficulty. But over and over again, even here we're seeing, once again, that even at the day of judgment, God God sends an angel to proclaim the good news, the, the good news that can save people, and is presenting opportunities for people to repent. But the Bible records that this, that God's desire is not for people to go to hell. He's not waiting just for for you to roast in hell. His desire is for people to be saved. So if if you have this idea, or maybe this is a God that has been presented to you through time, that there's this malevolent God just waiting for you to screw up, let me just give you three quick verses that will ultimately destroy that idea. That that God doesn't want for people to experience wrath and destruction. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord isn't being isn't really being so so about his promise, as some think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want 
anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. There has to be repentance. Right? So as we look at this, we're seeing that the time has expired, but that time is being delayed because God wants people to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says that God wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Right? He doesn't want for people to be deceived. That's the reason that we preach this message. He wants people to be saved. God wants for people to be spared from the difficulties and understand the truth that they are rejecting. Ezekiel chapter, you know, and sometimes we, we look at the New Testament and say, well, that's, that's the God of the New Testament. Jesus was loving. The God of the Old Testament was angry all the time. That, it can't be. For one, if you believe in the Trinity of God, then that means that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God. And Jesus says, I can only teach what the Father reveals to me. So once again, there is no contradiction. And Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23 says, Do you think that I like to see wicked people die, says the Sovereign Lord? Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. God's desire is not for people to roast in hell. God's desire is not for people to be punished. God's desire is for people to repent of the way that they are going. And the point of the gospel, being proclaimed, announced, shared to the people of the world, not to the people that are saved, is evidence that God does not take pleasure or joy in the ruin and the destruction of wicked people. The goal is for them to repent. But then there comes a point where time runs out. And we've talked about this, right? God removes his uh, restraint and ultimately the world will perish. And every individual will stand either justified because of the work of Jesus or face judgment because of the rejection of the truth, refusing to turn from their ways and refusing to repent of their sins. And, and that, that's the two options. There's no middle ground. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, describes that there is going to be a time where the fall of Babylon will come. Now, we often think about Babylon in the Old Testament, but understand that the Bible uses a lot of words that are synonymous for, for something else. And Babylon is just synonymous for a world system that opposes God. Ultimately, it's a rebellious nation. It is an immoral nation. So the system that opposes God is ultimately said to finally be falling. Then it turns to a third angel that is mentioned. And as we talked about last week, this angel is announcing the destruction of everyone who has either worshipped or taken the mark of the beast. We talked about what that meant. The mark that condemns people is not a physical mark. And we talked about that, a very difficult conversation and even understanding of the mark, that if you take it, you're ultimately destined to go to hell and there is no, repent, or there is no opportunity for repentance. That's simply not the case. We talked about what worship and allegiance is. And the interesting part about this verse is that we get glimpses into heaven in the book of Revelation, but this gives us a glimpse into hell. And one of the popular depictions in pop culture is that hell is party central, right? That's, that's where everybody goes. There, there is no God. Ultimately, you get to do whatever you please, and there's no oversight. However, this is what verse 10 states, that the people that ultimately worship the beast and took the, the mark will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Hell's not absent of oversight. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief or uh, day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. In a series that we did a number of years back titled Erasing Hell, we talked about whether hell is literal or maybe just a, a spiritual or place of conscience. And, and it's, a, it's a physical place, as, as we understand it in Scripture. And understand that there's no indulgence. You don't, just because you reject Christ doesn't mean that you get to continue to do whatever pleases you and brings you pleasure. Ultimately, this is a place of suffering. And the verse tells, and actually, if we were to look at this, at what Revelation tells us is hell is not prepared for people. It was prepared for 
Satan and his demons. But ultimately, people who worship the beast will end up there. Now, this verse also tells us what will take place in the presence of the angels. Once again, there's going to be suffering. Verse 12 encourages encourages God's holy people, believers from all time to hold, or in this time period before the return of Christ, encourages believers to hold on and to obey God's command and maintain their faith in Jesus. That's what the book of Revelation is doing. Hey, things are going to get difficult and they're going to continue to, to, to intensify, but hold on. Don't, don't give up. Keep pressing forward. And ultimately, maintain your faith in Jesus. Once again, we talked about how the seal of God's people is not based on a physical mark. We often talk about the mark of the beast without really talking about the mark of God, which is mentioned more in the book of Revelation than the mark of the beast. But once again, these are people who worship the Lamb, who follow the Lamb, are in allegiance and have faith in the Lamb. And verse 13 promises uh, and a blessing by saying that all believers who die from now on will rest and their good works will follow them. So now there might be a contradiction there, right? I mean, I thought we didn't have good works. Understand that when, when we talk about works, we often think that that's a byproduct of ourselves. And as I have been in the faith longer, one of the things that I've realized is that as I've walked in faith, Often I find myself doing things that I really don't want to do, but I feel like God is calling me to do. And it's things that are beneficial for someone else, but ultimately not necessarily the things that benefit me. And when we think about good works, even James talks about, show me, uh, you know, some people say they have works and other people say they have faith. And James says, you know, I'll show you my works by my faith. So one of the things that we understand is that within some religions and even some uh, denominations, what begins to happen is we place the focus on works without recognizing that faith is the only thing that can produce works. A great way that I have heard this illustrated is if you picture a tree, what most people want to do is they want to place the, the works at the roots and then the tree is, what's, is the faith that springs up from it. It's actually the opposite way. Faith is the root of it and ultimately it is going to produce good works, right? So Without the Spirit of God working in, with us, in us, sorry, working in us, ultimately, there is no good works that would stand as they are being tested. But these good works will follow us, and that's what it says. As we get to the end of the chapter, we finally arrive at the event that can only be described as harvesting season. And right now in rural Minnesota, we're seeing a lot of harvesting, right? We're, we're seeing that things are being picked up, and before we could get to that season... It has to be ripe, right? It has to get to the point where it's ready to be picked up. Last week, Bob brought us a, a ton of potatoes, which was phenomenal. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's potato season, right? We're, we're harvesting because now winter's coming. And this is what is described, similar to that, this is what is described in Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 16. And it says, Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man, he had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, it's easy to speculate that this son of man is Jesus. Well, some speculate that it could be a, an, an angel. But once again, likely, and my belief is that it's Jesus. And then it says that an, another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, Swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. The crop on the earth is ripe. It's harvesting season. So the one sitting on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth, and the whole earth was harvested. If you joined us before in, in this series, you've likely heard me say this over and over again, but you have to understand, you have to understand, that the book of Revelation is not a linear timeline. You know, you can't read... Start with chapter 1 and say, well, chapter 2 is the next event, chapter 3 is the next event, chapter 4 is the next event. That's actually not what's taking place. And we see it over and over again because we've kind of gotten to this point where judgment, the judgment period is already coming. And then it seems to reset and restart. And we're going to see it over again in the following weeks. But it's giving us a big picture of the end from different vantage points. 
as we've talked about before. We have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, ultimately representing seven very similar events. It's just giving us different vantage points. And when it comes to this harvesting, there are different views as to what it means. In regards to this period of time, some would see this as a rapture that is going to take place, which is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, the the word rapture anyways. But this is believed to be a moment when believers are transported to go into heaven, you know, from the earth to heaven. And there are some that believe that this rapture and, and is not going to be believers, but it will consist of both believers and non-believers. So in other words, everyone will kind of be taken at the same time. As so the one that is seated on the cloud that was like the Son of Man, likely Jesus, harvests the entire world. That's what it says, right? I'm, I'm not making this up. That's what it says. So there's no distinction that is made there. It just says that the entire earth was harvested, which would be composed of believers and non-believers. Now, the interesting part is that this would actually line up with what Jesus states in Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 and 33, where he says that at the end of the age, all the nations will be gathered in his presence, all nations, and he will separate the people as the shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will uh, place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. So in order for there to be a separation, then it has to be both, right? It has to be harvested and then separated. And one of the interesting things is, is there's different views in regards to the rapture, which I don't believe it's a point of division. You know, you could believe as, as you wish. Nonetheless, when I look at Scripture, I don't see that it happens multiple times. Ultimately, it, it seems to be that it, it happens. And then there is a division before judgment. And others believe that the harvest of the earth will not include people of faith. You know, I remember the first time that I heard this, I thought it was like the weirdest thing ever. But it was this belief that this harvest or this rapture, this taking of people out of the earth, won't be the the good guys, it's going to be the bad guys. And the reason actually is based on what follows in the final verses of this chapter, where it says that after that, Another angel came from the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who had the power to destroy with fire came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with a sharp sickle, Swing your sickle now so the, to gather the cluster of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great wine press of God's wrath. It's, it's not... Good things, it's bad things. The grapes were trampled in the wine press outside of the city, and blood flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long, as high as a horse's bridle. So the clusters of grapes of the earth are ripe enough to be trampled on, right? Which is the way that wine was made. You had to, this was the way that you stepped on them to extract the juice out of them. And these ripe grapes are fully developed. That's what it says, right? They're, they're, they're ripe. They're, they're ready. And the season has come to be fully loaded into God's wine, pre- wine press of wrath. Based on the symbolism that we're given here, grapes being crushed in a wine press is assumed to be the reaping, the harvesting, not of good people, God's people. We'll put it that way but lost people who have rejected the truth and their wickedness has fully matured. In other words, there's no more time. It's done. And now they're going to experience the full wrath of God. Once again, regardless of what view you hold, we know that at some point, at some point, everyone will stand before the holy throne of God to be either justified by Jesus' sacrifice or condemned in the rejection of the truth. That's what we know to be true. So the final verse gives us a gruesome description of violent proportions. And this event is linked to the Battle of Armageddon that is said to be taking place outside of the city of Jerusalem or in Megiddo. The harvested grapes, which represent people, are trampled on. And out of the trampled grapes, wine doesn't come out, right? So we understand it's symbolic of people. It actually says that blood 
flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. So 180 miles long, that's, that's a long distance. As a matter of fact, I, I kind of just did a quick search. It would be like getting your car right now and driving all the way past the Mall of America. It would actually be past the airport down the city. That, that's how long it is, right? It's going to go for 180 miles in distance, and it's going to reach up to a horse's bridle. And regardless of how you want to break that down, to reach that far, that's going to be a ton of bodies. And while some believe that this is a literal description of a zone of carnage, you know, during this climatic battle, some try to kind of get creative, maybe that it's not just simply blood, but maybe it's the bodies that are reaching that high. Some others even saying that maybe it's not necessarily bodies, but it's more so the, the severity of the violence that is going to cause blood to splatter on the horse's bridle. Now, if there's something that is that gruesome, I'm pretty sure it's going to go well beyond the horse's bridle, right? Not only that, but it's also difficult to, to kind of reconcile horses used in the final battle, considering that um, ultimately we really don't use horses in the battle. So it, that could be the, the number, ultimately. But nonetheless, I believe that this is something different. So the passage doesn't really indicate that it's going to be splattered. So I believe that that's simply just not the case. It actually states that it's going to be a stream that stretches over a distance of 1,600 stadia, which is estimated to be a little bit over 180 miles. It's, it's a little bit more than that. The height is not exact. That's the other issue. But it's defined as, horse, as high as a horse's bridle. I don't want to diminish the fact that things can change, but I, I just don't see this being a, a war that is fought with horse, or even if you wanted to measure it that way, it's, it's a lot of blood. The horse's bridle can vary between four and six feet. The one thing that the passage doesn't indicate is the width. In other words, we have no idea how wide this is going to be. There is no circumference that is mentioned, or, or radius, there's nothing. So the exact volume that, of blood that is needed is really hard to figure. However, being the curious creature that I am, I decided to do some math and try to figure out what kind of death toll <coughs> would be required. <coughs> Excuse me. Would be required to produce this kind of blood if, if it was the case. Once again, just, I'm just that kind of weird person that wants to kind of rule out any kind of possibility. So for a, conservative mo or for a conservative number, I just decided to say, okay, let's use the numbers that are figured in the Bible, and let's just conservatively say that it's one mile wide, right? That's not very wide um, in comparison to 180 miles, so we'll just figure a conservative strip of 180 miles by one mile wide by, you know, and, and just to simplify, because it doesn't really give us the... The height will try to figure out the average of the horse's bridle. So <clears throat> what I did is, in order to figure out the volume of something, I mean, I'm sure that there's, a, that there's actually a way to do it in miles, or sorry, in, in, yeah, I mean in miles, but in order to figure it out, I actually had to do a conversion to feet in order to figure out the volume of something. Okay. So this is the way that it went. And I just so I, I hate when people say, well, this is what I believe to be true, and there's no explanation. This is leading to what I believe to be true, so I'm going to give you a few numbers. You can take out your calculator if you want to check it. But nonetheless, there are 5,280 feet in a mile. So if you multiply 5,280 feet by 180 miles, you actually end up with 950,400 feet. That's a lot of feet. The horse's bridle, once again, is estimated between four and six feet. So for the sake of average, let's just go with five. That lands right in the middle. So I don't have to convert feet because it's actually feet, uh, and that's what it was. If you took the conservative width of a mile, it gives you 5,280 feet because that's exactly one mile. <clears throat> so once you have all those figures, you can actually multiply, and it's going to be 950,400 feet 
long by 5,280 feet wide by five foot deep, and you get the volume of 188,179,200,000 gallons of blood. That's a lot of blood. So it is estimated, though, that the human body does not contain gallons. Of course, it had to make it a little bit more difficult. It actually contains five liters, which, you know, you, and that's an estimate, right? That's, that's a man, women and children having a little bit less, depending on the size of the child. But that would be a different measurement now. So I have to try to figure it out even differently. In order to figure out the bodies, you need to figure out the liters. And in order to do that, you have to convert so in order to figure out how many people it would take, you have to convert those gallons to liters. And ultimately, it is estimated that one gallon holds 3.78541 liters. So now you have to do another math problem. So if you multiply the 188,179,200,000 gallons of blood, and you multiply it because you're trying to get liters, you in, uh, by 3.78541 it's going to give you a total of 712,335,425,000,000, or sorry, 712,335,000,000,425,472 liters. So if every person were to be drained entirely of blood, just figuring it at five liters, right, it would take approximately 142 billion four hundred and sixty seven million eighty five thousand ninety four people dying to produce that blood amount now here's the interesting part as of tuesday october third twenty twenty three the world population population was sitting at eight billion sixty four million one hundred and sixty thousand seven hundred and seventy three the amount required for this kind of blood for this kind of bloodshed would require 17 times over the current world population just to get to those numbers, that conservative number of a mile. And that's not even taking into account the fact, I mean, we know how rain works. In order for it to puddle up, the ground needs to be saturated. So there would be a lot of blood that would need to saturate the ground before it would actually start pulling up. Now, I, I want to give a couple of disclaimers. Can God in his power and sovereignty make this happen? Absolutely. You know, if he could turn water into blood, of course he can do this. There's no issue. Uh, is it possible that maybe the, the single stream of blood is describing maybe something that is different with only a single instance where the blood pulls up to the horse's bridle? Uh, of course, you know, that, that's a possibility as well. And, and there's other possibilities. However, I, I think that it just takes a lot of creativity to get there. I believe that there are many, and, I, and there are many others who actually hold on to this view, but I believe that this is not a literal description. It's symbolic again. And it's not simply because the numbers don't work out, but because the entire content of that chapter, as you have seen, is ultimately based on the gospel, right? It, it, it continues to talk about uh, the gospel, the redeemed, the saved. And, and, it, and as we see next week, as we talk about the next chapter, it talks about the Song of Moses. So it, it's talking about salvation. It's talking about the gospel. So throughout the chapter, we're told of the 144,000, which I believe are too great to count of people that accepted the gospel that were as pure as virgins, uh, blameless before God based on the life, of life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And God in his mercy and his grace is still sending out a messenger to announce a gospel before the time of wrath comes. After this, we are told that the system that opposes God, which is Babylon, falls. A third angel is said to announce the destruction of those who have worshipped or taken the mark of the beast, which will stand condemned for refusing to accept the truth and repent of their sins. And finally, we get to the harvest where we get the people being crushed, trampled, and experiencing the full wrath of God with the blood with blood in the scales of massive proportions. Well, I believe that there will definitely be a climatic battle, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to be gruesome, unlike anything else that has ever been experienced in history, in the present, and will, and will not be rivaled by anything in the future. The truth is this. In the beginning of the chapter, you got the Lamb, Jesus, who was standing outside of the city which in Mount Zion. 
Ironically enough, do you know where Jesus was crucified? Outside the city. His blood was shed, and this blood that was shed made, the for, made allowance for people to be saved from the wrath of God and ultimately be able to spend an eternity with him. It was because of the blood of Jesus that ultimately the entire world can have salvation. And it is not just blood that can cover every single person walking on the face of the earth today. That one sacrifice was good once and for all time from the moment that creation began to the moment that Jesus returns. And I believe that this passage is more than anything once again revealing that there is blood that is sufficient to forgive people, but these people refuse to repent. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15 puts it, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Hebrews says that he was raised once and for all. There is no more sacrifices that are needed. And it's a blood sacrifice that was made once and for all. As Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he came and died to give his life as a ransom for many. So even though he died for all, ultimately only many will be ransomed. And we're seeing that at the end, people will face judgment because they refuse that sacrifice that was made. Because not all will accept him, but all will be without excuse. So I believe that this passage speaks more clearly about the gospel message and the day of judgment than a physical description of a savage battle that for sure will come, but not in, in the blood proportions that some picture. So wherever you find yourself today, know that there is grace for today. You know, if you're struggling in sin, know that there is grace for today. That one sacrifice was sufficient for the forgiveness of sin. And while our actions will definitely bear consequences, no doubt about that, we are called to live different and understand this, salvation is not contingent upon us directly. There definitely will be evidence that is produced. There is going to be works produced because God uh, has sent his spirit to dwell in us that seals us for the day of, um, of his return. And the blood that is needed was already shed, right? So there's going to be evidence, but ultimately the blood has been shed that transferred us from eternal wrath to a place of mercy and forgiveness because the blood of Christ has been shed, not only for everyone who walks the face of the earth today, but from all time. A number that is too great to count. And what is required in order for this salvation to take place, as we've seen over again, over and over again in scripture, is not the forgiveness of a priest. It's not the forgiveness of a pastor. It's not even people's accepting of that you are repentant enough. What is required is a recognition of the truth that we are sinners that are in desperate need of grace. It requires us <clears throat> to understand that we're broken, that we're not good. We live in a culture that ultimately believes that we are good. We just screw up once in a while. No, we're, we're inherently bad. Repentance is required, which means that we will turn from the way we're going to, the, to following a new way of moving, which is what the 144,000 do. They turn and they follow the Lamb wherever He goes.